Our text this morning from the Old Testament is the culmination of a series of extreme ecological events and plagues that occurred in Egypt as a result of human sinfulness. Two races of people were divided and alienated from one another, trapped in a cycle of the oppressed and the oppressor. And on the verge of freedom, God makes sure they will never forget the slavery they've endured and the freedom that they've hoped for and would soon experience. Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the world, but he was no match for God. So this story is central in the life and faith of Judaism. Listen now as I read from Exodus 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, and the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Our gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We live in a divided society. This isn't news to any of us. Our culture sets us up to debate and disagree because this makes for lively TV and more division. None of us has ever won someone over to our point of view by arguing. We dig in and we refuse to budge. I can't change your mind when I'm mean-spirited and call you names. When we actually get to know each other and honor how we think apart from opinion and debate, the divisions between us begin to dissolve. This doesn't mean we change our minds, but it does mean we can discover the common goals that unite us and the different ways people of goodwill may view the world. Until we get to know each other better, our joys and our sorrows and our common humanity that we share, we risk becoming divided unnecessarily from one another. So I was pleasantly surprised in a recent edition of a popular magazine to discover a list entitled, Things We All Totally Agree On. Here are a few things from that list. Babies and kittens are cute. (laughs) So are puppies. Finding $20 in your coat pocket is never old. And Rose absolutely had room for Jack on that floating door. (laughs) Nutella should be a superfood. And sometimes you feel like a nut, and sometimes you don't. 
There's also something else not on this list which we all agree on, and that is the importance of memory and hope. Memory and hope. We all have memories and we all have hopes. Whether our memories are bitter or sweet, we remember. No matter the trial or temptation, we hold on to hope to survive the present as we wait for a better future. Memory and hope are highlighted in the book of Exodus. In the context of the devastating plagues visited upon Egypt, the hardened hearts and the consequences of sin, pride, and power, our text this morning stops briefly in chapter 12 that I read and gives instructions for observing the Passover. It is a worship liturgy. There are detailed instructions about how the event that hasn't happened yet is to be observed. It is later in chapter 12 when Moses in real time calls the elders of Israel together because it is time to go. At Passover, the Hebrews were called to remember. And there were specific instructions. There would be a sacrifice, a lamb would be killed and the blood painted on the doorpost. And the blood symbolized a sacrifice offered as a substitute. One life laid down for others. They needed to be ready to move at a moment's notice. The unleavened bread reflects the haste with which they left Egypt. There wasn't time for the yeast and the bread to rise. The bitter herbs common to Egypt would be eaten to remind them of the bitter years of servitude and slavery. And finally, the Lord would pass over the land and every firstborn animal and human would die, displaying God's power and letting everyone know all other gods were powerless. The Passover was a pledge of God's mercy. God promised you will live and you will be set free from oppression. Don't ever forget. Of course, the death of all the firstborn in Egypt, human and animal, is a horrific act that would never be forgotten by the Egyptians either. It wasn't the lamb or the blood that saved the Hebrews. It was the power of God. The lamb and the blood would forever be imprinted on their minds as symbols of God's power. And these instructions would later become the formal institution of the Passover for the Jewish nation. And in time, the Passover meal would be interpreted by Jesus at the Last Supper and transformed into our communion meal. That we too would never forget the life-giving love born of sacrifice that displayed the power and love of God. Memory and hope, essential to life, essential when there is trouble. And there was a lot of trouble in Egypt. We've all heard the quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it from the poet and philosopher George Santanaya. It's been quoted in various forms over the past century, including Winston Churchill when he addressed the House of Commons in 1948. I first heard it when I was studying history in college. And there's a practical application to this saying, who among us haven't discovered what happens when we forget the past? How many of us have made the same mistake twice? At Passover, the Jews remember slavery and they remember freedom. And at our communion meal, we also remember the slavery of sin and the freedom of forgiveness given in Christ's atoning death and resurrection. And as we are reminded in the Gospel of John, Jesus was the lamb that was slain, the lamb of God. And this imagery connects us back to the Passover and to God's chosen people. The blood of the lamb meant life for the Jews. And it means life for us, as foreign and ancient a custom as it is. We remember how we have been set free. In our sermon series in Exodus so far, we have heard about the command from Pharaoh to kill infants as they were being born. We heard about the practice of throwing male children into the Nile to drown. The slavery and oppression of an entire race of people. And we are reminded that God hears the cries of God's people 
and that God called Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh. And then time after time, if you read the story, Pharaoh hardens his heart and refuses to let God's people go in the face of an impressive display of God's power. For Pharaoh, violence was not out of bounds. It was expedient. It carried out his policy and reflected his fears. His heart was hardened. And so we have the Passover. The Hebrews were set free. God passed over and saved them, offering new life. And while this worship liturgy inserted in this part of the book may seem unnecessarily detailed, it calls them to always remember. Memory. Memory was an important part of that first journey out of Egypt. Memory is part of our journey. As I've been thinking about the power of memory, one of the most chilling movies I've ever watched came to mind. It was the 1993 movie Schindler's List. And as you know, it's the story of a man named Oskar Schindler who was a German businessman during World War II. He was responsible for saving almost 1,200 Jews from certain death in Nazi concentration camps by hiring them to work in his factories. Saving men, women, and children who were destined for death became his passion, and under the guise of the standing in his community, he was able to save lives. It's a difficult movie to watch. And at the end, there is a screenshot of Schindler's grave in Mount Zion Cemetery that's in Jerusalem. A long procession of people begin to walk slowly to Schindler's grave, and each one of them places a stone on his headstone. These people were the descendants of the people that he saved from death. Schindler never believed he did enough, and yet he's remembered as a hero. And this Jewish custom of placing a stone on a headstone goes back to ancient times when they would put a mound of stones over a gravesite. And a stone was placed on the grave as a reminder of those first humble gravesites. It's a sign of respect for the deceased person and also a remembrance. Schindler is not forgotten. This tradition is a powerful act of remembrance. And thanks to Steven Spielberg, the story has been kept alive. And the memory of this great man named Oscar Schindler has two. Memory. The children of survivors will always be grateful and keep Schindler's memory alive by placing a small stone on his grave. They pledge to never forget what human beings are capable of, of our ability for both great good and evil. And the way a faithful God uses others to make a difference in our lives. What about your memories? Are they bitter? Are they sweet? Memories take us back to our mistakes, the things we did and the things we didn't do that can't be repaired. Memory is powerful. It governs our choices about how we want to live. The memory of the mercy of God in our story shows us that we don't need to be perfect to receive God's love. We just need to be ready. And that gives us hope. Last winter, I went to Washington, D.C., and this is part of an annual trip to visit the grave of my father. He's buried in Arlington. And over the years, I've come to love going to Washington. I love the history and everything that our nation's capital represents. I enjoy the museums, and every time I visit, I learn something new from the past. And this last trip, I was reminded of something from the past that is now happening again. At the American History Museum, there was an exhibit on the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. And the Poor People's Campaign, uh, sometimes called the Poor People's March on Washington, was a 1968 effort to gain economic justice for poor people in the United States. And participants set up a 3,000-person protest camp on the Washington Mall, where they stayed for six weeks in the spring of 68. And the exhibit I saw housed pictures and 
and the actual tents that people lived on on the Washington Mall during that campaign. And I was old enough to remember the reports of that campaign on the evening news, and I re remember my parents being very upset and angry, but it was the times. I mention this because on our way home from Washington, I heard that another Poor People's Campaign was being organized. And it reminded me that we haven't solved the problem of poverty for people of all races. An interviewer on Sirius XM was speaking with a pastor about the campaign, and he was asked if he was optimistic and hopeful about ending poverty. And then the pastor said something about hope that has really stuck with me. He said, there is a difference between hope and optimism. When he said this, I began thinking about all those who are struggling. It might be poverty, but it could easily be any challenge. So many people are on a difficult journey. It could be poverty, illness, or you fill in the blank. Are you searching for hope today? There's a difference between hope and optimism. Optimism is confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. It's a positive attitude, a friendly smile, a welcoming handshake. Optimism is focused on the confidence we have in ourselves. Optimism says, I can do it. At a previous church I served, I visited an older couple who was very active in the life of the church. Earl was a member of the Optimist Club, and this is a wonderful service organization. They do good work all around the world. And Earl proudly displayed the Optimist Creed on the wall of their apartment. And the creed had reminders in it, such as, promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind, or talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. Think only of the best, to work only for the best, and to expect only the best. Wear a cheerful countenance at all times. Be too large to worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. Positive affirmations. But when Earl's wife, Eileen, was diagnosed with terminal cancer, he found it difficult to be optimistic. The words of the creed he lived by were little help as he tried to cope with a devastating disease. He struggled, but he forced himself to act as if what they were going through wasn't so bad. Earl hid his feelings behind a smile when he drove Eileen to chemo or sat by her hospital bed. He did his best to be strong for her, but eventually this wore him out and he became a shell of his former self. I believe that a positive attitude and determination are important, but not when you ignore your feelings. Even though there were dedicated caregivers taking care of Eileen while she was ill, Earl was so frail when she died that he had to be carried to her graveside. His sons were convinced that he would be joining her very soon. But people in the church who knew and loved this couple wouldn't let Earl waste away in his grief. In visit after visit, his friends and his Stephen minister listened to him as he expressed his pain. And ever so slowly, he came back to life. Earl found out that he could be optimistic, but what really sustained him was hope. He discovered that hope is born of tribulation and perseverance, the things that his faith had taught him. And now he was putting his faith into practice as he placed his life into the hands of God. Earl regained his strength and remained a member of the Optimist Club while embracing the power of hope. Hope isn't wishful thinking and it certainly isn't optimism. The Hebrews enslaved in Egypt weren't optimistic. But when they put their trust in God, they discovered hope. They prayed, and God heard their cries for help. God hears us too. Hope is what we cling to when everything goes wrong. 
You may have come here this morning longing to hear a word of hope or trying to find a way to offer hope to someone else. Hope is the willingness and the ability to work toward change in the midst, in the midst of struggle, and here's how. I heard this quote, it's not original with me. Hope has two children, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, at what bothers you for everything that just isn't right. When something bad is happening, anger is often the first emotion that we feel after shock. And so it then takes courage to feel and express this anger. It takes courage to address what's bothering you in a life-giving way, whether it's making decisions about health care or deciding that you're going to get help, whatever it may be. In order to work toward change, you need to deal with your situation and face the struggle with humility and grace. It's okay to feel our anger and rail against God. There's a place for this. And once we do, we can work through uh, solutions to address what's bothering us or, or what's wrong instead of trying to wish it away. We need courage to admit we need help. It takes courage to work through difficulty, and this is true for personal struggles like anxiety and fear, as well as community struggles against oppression and injustice. I heard someone say hope is the wild ride between peace and fear. It was a wild ride for the Hebrews, and it's a wild ride for us. Our text this morning reminds us that when people gather to worship, we take this hope-filled ride together. Memory reminds us of God's faithfulness, and when we worship, we experience the presence of the living God who is with us, who was with us in the past, and who's with us now. We live in the hope of this day. We don't hold the future in our hands, but God does. An anonymous author wrote this. Sometimes we as Christians need to stop along life's road and look back. Although it might have been winding and steep, we can see how God directed us by his faithfulness. And here are some reminders in the Bible of what the Christian can see when he or she looks back. The deliverance of the, the Lord has wrought, the way God has led, the blessings God has bestowed, the victories God has won, the encouragements the Lord has given. When we face difficulties, we sometimes forget God's past faithfulness. We see only the detours and the dangerous path in front of us, but look back. And you will also see the joy of victory, the challenge of the climb, the presence of your traveling companion who has promised never to leave or forsake you. Memory and hope for all God has done and for all that God will do. The power of this reality is something we can all agree on. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.